Um, Mark is a co-founder and chair of the French Transhumanist Association, and uh, he has been organizing Transvision since 2014. He also organized this one. So, yeah, Mark. Thank you very much. Due to the poor quality of the recording of my conference uh, during Transvision 2024, uh, it was, uh, I was asked to re-record my speech. So, here it is. From the very beginning of the transhumanist movement, and as soon as the idea of mental enhancement was considered, ethical question was raised. Bioconservatives, of course, are keen to demonstrate that technological interference with the human brain, other than for therapeutic purposes, can only be harmful. Techno-progressives have wondered how to make this movement possible, while avoiding, as far as possible, the many abuses that are feared when our personal privacy is invaded. In recent years, the continuing advances in neuroscience, combined with biotechnology, artificial intelligence, medical imaging, and so on, have led to a growing awareness of these issues that have reached the political level. These are no longer just academic debates or debates between technical and medical specialists. Institutions such as the OECD and the, Union, Union, the European Union have commissioned committees to produce reports and recommendations aimed at regulating the development not only of neuroscience or therapeutic purposes, but even of neuroenhancement. We might ask then, what role is left for transhumanists? After all, perhaps they have already done their job. They have played their vanguard role. The facts have proved them right. They can now leave the serious people to deal with the regulations of developing technologies. Except that this regulation does not take place in the same way depending on the frame of mind in which the prospects for human improvement are approached. A transhumanist perspective opens the door to bold legislation, whereas institu institutional legislators are often guided by a precaution that can be cruelly lacking in positive imagination. Neurotechnologies are continuing to make progress, initially in the therapeutic field, but as usual, the boundary between care and improvement is porous. Here are a few recent examples of what can be achieved through brain-machine interfaces, genetic engineering, and pharmacopoeia. A neural implantation interpreted by AI has made it possible to decode the words thought uh, by three paralytic patients unable to speak. Or in China, children have been cured of their congenital deafness thanks to gene therapy. Or a team of researchers from CNRS and University Claude Bernard in Lyon, in collaboration with King's College London, has succeeded in inducing neuron regeneration in mice. Last example, the microdosing of uh, psychotropic drugs such as LSD and psilocybin continues to spread, opening up new avenues for both treatment and enhancement. So, what specific contribution can transhumanism continue to make? For transhumanists, it's a question of thinking about the positive applications of neuroscience in terms of mental improvements. Ideally, we would like to base our approach on our goals. May I improve my cognitive abilities, memories, speed, logic, etc., or concentration, alertness, creativity? Do I want to improve my behavioral dispositions, like empathy, tolerance, curiosity, tenderness, and so on? Intelligently modulate my tendencies toward aggression, dominance, psychology, psychological or sexual predation. 
or maybe I want to control my propensity for consumption and to accumulation, or to xenophobia and to herd instincts. Or would I just like to optimize my ability to think independently and critically? But in all the case, it's not easy to identify which technologies will bring us closer to these goals. For example, uh, we are still not able to intervene in a relevant way in the functioning of myron neurons, which are probably just as much involved in empathy and tenderness as they are in xenophobia and herd instincts. We are still not capable of fine-tuning aggressive tendencies, and we don't know how to use technology to regulate xenophobia. Alternatively, we can try to think of this implementation in terms of technologies that have already been perfected or are currently being developed. At this point, I would like to give you three concrete examples of path explored by the AFT members, the French Transhumanist Association. About ultrasound capture using implants. Until last year, I thought that cochlear implants, which enable deaf people to regain a certain degree of hearing, were a good example of technologies that should fall under the heading of transhumanism. In fact, they only need to be adjusted appropriately to pick up sounds that are not audible in the usual range of human perception, such as ultrasound. However, after ob obtaining detailed information on how these implants work, I have concluded, for the time being, that their use by deaf people will give no better results than the use by hearing people of systems composed of sensor and hearing headsets. It seems that being fit with a cochlear implant does not add anything better than an external hearing aid. It will probably be easier to test the benefits of capturing ultrasound with hearing people, and I think it will be interesting to promote this kind of test. Not that uh, there are already many applications for ultrasound capture, whether it's medical imaging, geolocation, or helping blind people with electronic walking sticks. But here, I want to talk about the possibility of an able-bodied person being able to pick up ultrasound directly through his or her biological organs. In other words, to sense the environment a bit like a, a dolphin or a bat, if you want. If it can be very complicated to develop such a systems, it's still up to us to try. Now, other examples for improving concentration or controlling sleep using a EEG neurofeedback or even a TMS with magnetic stimulation, electromagnetic stimulation. Over the, the past two years, some 15 members of AFT Technoprog have been experimenting in, with this technique. We collectively bought a good quality EEG headband, the Muse S, and pass it from one to the other. The headband traveled to several regions for France and five countries in Europe. We had an experimental protocol drawn up by a neuroscientist who is a member of the International Neurotech X network. The data collected has now to be analyzed. But the trial has already shown that it is difficult to carry out such an experiment outside the clinical setting. Apart from the fact that it is not possible to check whether the conditions under which each volunteer practice and are identical, the equipment has worn out, and after two years, the headband was virtually unusual, unusable. Nevertheless, uh, several of the volunteers are now interested in moving on and testing a transcranial magnetic stimulation headset. 
Last uh, examples about microdosing of psychotropic drugs and specifically the case of psilocybin. In recent years, the practice of microdosing of psychotropic drugs have become widespread. This may involve ASD, but this substance is gener generally prohibited outside the medical context. On the other hand, and uh, our host in the Netherlands are well placed to know this, certain variants of plants or mushrooms containing psilocybin are freely sold and consumed in Europe. This is the case with magic truffles. One of our close sympathizers has tried them and in two articles published on our association website, he described the effects as particularly satisfying in terms of mental improvements. Attention and concentration seems to be considerably heightened and creatively is multiplied, not to mention the beneficial effects on mood. I intend to follow in his footsteps, and I invite those of you who are curious about this approach to find out more. However, even if the substance in question is reputed to be no more addictive than coffee, it is advisable not to use it without medical supervision and the supervision of people around you. The risk may seem slight and in prison surprises rare, but as with coffee, there are never zero secondary effects. Which raises the question of risks. How to deal with risks. In recent years, thinking on the need to create neural rights have undergone significant development. The most advanced thinking has undoubtedly taken place in childhood. During the attempt to revise the Pinochet Constitution, the Neural Right Foundation, a dedicated association, was set up. At the end, the Constitution was rejected, but their work led to the vote on the world's first law protecting neural rights. For its part, the OECD has been addressing this issue since 2019, resulting in the recommendations set out in the report on responsible innovation in neurotechnology. And the Euro European discussion uh, are also taking place with, uh, for example, a STOA conference in November 2021 entitled Neurotechnologies and Human Rights Framework. Do we need new rights? Other examples? The United Nations, which uh, as part of its AI for Good platform for global and inclusive action on AI, held a session on neurotechnologies, AI and human rights in December 2023. But these discussions are often an opportunity to hear strong bioconservative precautions. In these circles, transhumanists are very easily made scapegoats. As I heard, for instance, Professor Guillermo Woods say at the above-mentioned STOA conference. Hence, the need to also express a techno-progressive vision. Transhumanists are and must continue to be present in this arena. But if we want to be convincing to the public and to institutions, it is imperative to demonstrate that we are not Dr. Strangelove, but on the contrary, that we, are, we continue to be among those people who help to anticipate risk. We need to think ahead. Health risk linked to infectious uh, or malfunctions, technological dependency and its consequences. Here, um, concrete examples. In 2023, uh, the company Second Sight which had developed the August retinal implant to enable blind people to stimulate their visual neurons and regain the beginnings of visions, went bankrupt. Equipped patients found themselves without the possibility of upgrades or repair and were plunged back into darkness. Many had to have their implants removed. The media regularly talk about the risk of controls posed by connected neurological devices. Here too, we need to be careful. 
However, I can give you a counter example. You may remember reading articles uh, uh, a few years ago denouncing the appearance of the first communicating pacemakers. It was announced that it would be possible to kill someone remotely by switching off the device. Today, nobody talks about this uh, anymore for the good reason that this uh, type of remote control is not technically possible. The risks are sometimes invented out in thin hair. In exchange, I don't think we should underestimate the role of socio-economic pressure. In the world we live in, it's likely that some people will feel or find themselves obliged to adopt a neural processes of psychotropic drugs. This is the risk I fear most. Much more than those linked to cyber dictatorship, for instance. And we will have to be constantly alert to risk that we cannot yet imagine. We must systematically combine our neural improvement project with regulatory proposals that strike a balance between access to the beneficial uses of technologies and protections against their malicious uses. Fortunately, on a number of occasions, members of our community have put forward a different voice. In particular, faced with the risk inherent in the ongoing development of efficient neurotechnologies, they have argued that it is essential to fight to maintain and develop strong systems of political checks and balances to guard against the likely abuses of power by political, economic or media players. I'm referring in particular to the Enhancements Cognitive, Moral and Moods conferences held in Belgrade in 2013 and online in 2021 and organized by the Serbian Center for the Study of Bioethics and the Center of the Biotics and Humanities at Oxford Universities. Not only transhumanists must promote the defense of neural rights and advocate absolutely inviolability of private mental life, because violating this privacy will be tantamount to torture, but we must fight to preserve the objective of universal access, pluralism, openness, and the open dimension of mental enhancement technologies. In my view, we must struggle to force companies to give up their monopolies on components, hardware, and software as soon as possible when technologies become an integral part of people. And in parallel, we must avoid any kind of solutionism. So, in conclusion, we know that accompanying the evolution of our societies in their transhumanist transformation, it's not easy, even less so to enable mental enhancement. But the international transhumanist movement is working in this direction by setting an example and carrying out trials, by disseminating information to enable all those who wish to move in this direction to do so, by advising institutional bodies to make it seem and heard that positive mental improvements for all is possible by attracting more capital and encouraging changes in legislation to enable new trials to be carried out, and by contributing to the development of protection and neural rights that provide the best possible framework for risks and potential, potential abuses. Because, to paragraph once more time, Henri Laborie, until we allow humans to understand how their mental functions are developed and how they can modulate their behavior by voluntarily modifying their biological predetermination, nothing, no xenophobia, no hatred, no the exploitation of humans by humans, no war will ever change. This is my conviction to date. But I would very much like to hear other views on these crucial issues. What should transhumanists do to promote mental enhancement? Thank you very much.